Hi, uh, I'm going to talk today about point of care molecular technologies and challenges to meeting the assured criteria. Now, I have mainly two stakeholders that I'm kind of, this talk is geared towards. One, broadly defined as, de as supply stakeholders. You'll see what I mean by that. Second, demand stakeholders. There's a third category in there which I'll talk about, which are many of us facilitators, but these two groups uh, are kind of what I had in mind when I pre prepared this talk. And I should say these are big challenges. So the assured criteria, this, these, this was published, I think, in 2010 by Rosanna Peeling. And it was mainly focused on very simple, easy to use lateral flow assays. And it's a great mnemonic tool because assured stands for some really important things that you got to take care of when you're developing, on the supply side, developing diagnostic tests. Look at this. So uh, assured stands for affordable, sensitive, specific, user friendly, robust, equipment free, and deliverable. Okay, so I'm going to blow through quite a few of these slides because I have way too many slides uh, for a short talk, but I want to focus some time on the, the, the back end, which is quite important. So I cannot tell you how many times I've reviewed grantees' uh, inquiries into look at what, look at this cool thing that I've got. And uh, it's really great to see this innovation. You know, th uh, there is a huge amount of creative thinkers out there that are, are really going to be coming up with what we need in the future. But to a large degree, they're kind of like me. They're, gear they're tech kind of geeks, right? They like the gadgets. So there's lots of lessons that uh, I've learned and I'm conveying to them. And the first one is don't assume if, if we build it, they will come. They will not come. If you build it, probably nobody even know, you're probably building the wrong thing. Um, and this is really true. Uh, and I'll show you an interesting slide in a minute. But um, a lot of the guys, men and women that I talk to that send these inquiries, they're kind of technocentric thinkers. And there really is a need for technology. Don't get me wrong. Necessary, but not by any means sufficient. OK. So we commissioned a uh, study from uh, using Halteris to ask the question, why do diagnostic companies fail? Now, this is a really important summary slide. It's a funnel. And you'll note that the large majority of them just didn't get the clinical need. Either they thought this cool thing was the best thing for whatever, or it didn't perform. But you know, a good 70% of these innovations fail in this first slice, which is didn't meet the clinical need. So uh, this is a, a quite an interesting slide. And there are multiple phases as you go through product development. Um, but the, the heavy hitting one is don't assume if, if we build it, they will come. You, know, you really have to understand on the demand side, <laughs> what is the problem that needs to be solved? OK. The second kind of challenge is, uh, look, begin with the end in mind. So there's a great book. And I have a few of these great books that I highly recommend. And this is one of them. It's by Stephen Covey. And it is uh, entitled The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you haven't read it, you should read it. I see some heads not here. So you guys who have read this understand this is, this is really quite a good, uh, good reference. So habit number two is begin with the end in mind. Don't think, look at this cool thing that we can do. Look at what is the end game. Where, where are we trying to get to? And really, where we're trying to get to is that you're running through this gauntlet of several things. And failures included not only the technology, but the prototype didn't work, or the product wasn't de designed for ma scaled manufacturing. We, we, I've got stories for you. I can tell you where there were failures, and they were pretty expensive failures. Or the, the clinical trials didn't meet the, the performance requirements. But even if you do all of that, the last one is, is necessary to reach the, the finish line. And that is, you have to have adoption in the market. And this is quite important for our global health. And I'll show you why in a minute. Now, a lot of these early innovators, you know, I just lesson, you know, look, go read this thing called the target product profiles. This is my, the go-to place. If you want to know what we're trying to, to do in TB for four types of diagnostic tests, go to this. And it's amazing how many uh, the innovators I talk to aren't even aware of this publication. So you know, most of the assured criteria are probably going to be listed in these TPPs. So it's a, another important document to go to. OK, so 
for each of these, you know, the, the impactors for affordable, this, this is another one, uh, is that, um, you know, we are not talking about an uh, MD, PhD clinician in a air-conditioned molecular lab, you know, kind of environment, right? You know, you can charge $500 for this thing. Now, the, there are real budgets, there are real concerns, and so the first criteria is affordable. And Claudia, uh, uh, Claudia mentioned a couple of these in her talk, uh, you know, like a $2 triage test or a $5 molecular test. Okay, so uh, know the difference. Now, affordability is not cost effectiveness. And I've seen publications on cost effectiveness where an intervention was cost effective, but it was still not affordable. So an important distinction. Um, another challenge is design from the very beginning the device to be for low-cost manufacturing at high volumes. Now that's a tall order, but you know, ultimately, if you're going to have impact, which I'll talk about in a minute, you need high volumes, and those high volumes require a high volume manufacturing strategy. So a lot of innovators on the supply side don't take care of this. Um, simplify, simplify, simplify. If you can have a device that is, uh, instead of 12 plastic, injection molded plastic pieces that half of which have to be hand fitted, versus uh, something that is like three and they are done on a robotic line. Okay, try to make it as simple as possible because each component you add adds cost. Um, know your COGS. And I talk to some of these guys and these guys say, oh, I know what COGS are. You know, they don't know what COGS are. These are not little teeth in a gear, right? This is cost of goods sold. And it's a real important attribute that will impact affordability. So if the cost of making the thing with no profit margin is $10, you're not gonna have a $5 pricing for a molecular test. So the other thing is the pricing versus volume, which is a conundrum. Um, most innovators, uh, you know, we, we need low pricing in the assured criteria. And most innovators uh, don't really think about the, uh, you know, the manufacturing scheme um, and I'll talk about in a minute this balance between pricing and volume, but going out the gate, if you've got the greatest test in the world, it's not going to have, you know, let's say it's a case detection test, it's not going to have a 10 million unit volume in the first year. Probably won't reach 10 million for a few years. Uh, and there is a direct correlation between volume and pricing. So the higher the volume, the lower the cost of goods sold, because you get economies of scale, so your pricing can go down. So the impactors on, on affordability are shown here. On sensitivity and specificity, you know, the first thing is if you've got a biomarker, then how well does that biomarker predict the phenotype that you're going after? Compared in a population that has it versus a population that really does not have it. Um, and so some of the tricks within assay development is, okay, how do you get a cutoff that can have optimized sensitivity and optimized specificity. And here, simply two populations that overlap. So this is not a great cutoff to separate these two. You've got a lot of false positives and false negatives with this situation. So a lot of innovators, and these are the tricks of the assay developer, is whatever you can do with your reagents and your design to spread these populations out so that now you have a clean cutoff saying if I have, what a fluorescence units or whatever, at this level, that separates the true negatives from the true positives. And so this is just kind of some assay development tricks that are important. Another way to do this is, okay, tighten your precision. So if you've got a negative population, you can do things to tighten those distributions up so you get a clean separation as well. Um, and if you're really lucky, you're able to do both. So the broader the separation, uh, the better, more likely you'll have high sensitivity and specificity. User friendliness. Okay, so the only thing I'm going to say, and, and this, I, I've coined the phrase sitting in Seattle syndrome, where uh, certain parties whom I won't mention think this is what these guys need. And um, you really have got to go and visit the place that you think your intervention is going to be. And not only go there, you should probably spend, you know, just camp out for six months or so, and then you'll finally start to realize what is really needed and the constraints in these, what I call, intended use settings. Don't think that uh, you can read the literature and then figure out, look what we can do, okay? You're probably going to fail. Robust and rapid. So uh, this is uh, one where there's a real need for innovators. Um, I see a lot of what I call me too kind of innovators where they build on a previous concept and say, we can do this 
better. Well, it's, this is not the level of innovation that we need. We need to leapfrog to another world with innovation. And so, uh, so to get there, there are certain, uh, besides having creative talent to come up with these ideas, there are some best practices that really relate to kind of statistical process control and DOE. Um, the main thing is that in this category, robust and rapid, um, you will come to a place where you have a trade-off analysis. You will probably not be able to hit all of the ideal TPP specifications for a triage test. You'll probably have to, you'll see a hit somewhere. And so you have to decide what are the really important ones. And being robust is like really important and reproducible and rapid is important. Equipment free, now this is not really fair for molecular because I think I agree with Claudia. I'm not expecting to see a, uh, a $1 NAT test on a lateral flow type thing here uh, anytime soon. So for molecular, we're going to probably need instruments. That's okay. You, but if you have a uh, $50,000 instrument, that's not okay. If you have maybe a $1,000 instrument, probably okay. It's in the TPP, so you should read it. Uh, again, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the setting, understanding the setting, uh, is there running water? Uh, does the system need con continued electricity? You know, does it ha will it survive, you know, in ambient temperatures, which can be 40 degrees centigrade? So, um, you know, the instrumentation really has got to be setting appropriate. Um, deliverable. Now, this is a big one. Deliverable to those who need them. And uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, what is probably the biggest threat that we have right now. I, I see a lot of innovation, and you've got to go through that funnel, don't get me wrong, but you have got to get to the end game. And so I'm going to talk about chasms. So here's another great book. If you haven't read this, uh, I highly recommend it. It's uh, by Jeffrey Moore called Crossing the Chasm. And this was written like 20 or 30 years ago, and it's about tech guys who say, look what we can build. <laughs> <laughs> and they have all their buddies who are also tech guys, and they like this kind of stuff. And they're all the visionaries, the early adopters. But the main market, you really have a product. And you, you know, if you're a for-profit entity, you, know, you have to have a positive cash flow. You know, this, this, this is for profit. You've got to cross over to the mainstream market. And a lot of these innovators fall in this first chasm. They can't get past the early adopters and visionaries. Well. This slide, I've taken from Jackie Hood at Stop TV Partnership, talks about two gaps. And I love this slide. It talks about the first valley of death, which is that first chasm. And you know, from development to commercialization, these are the, some of the faults. Inadequate business models, poor understanding of clinician and patient health system behavior, insufficient evaluation in the intended use setting, they just fall into that chasm. But some of them actually do make it to a commercial state. But here's the kicker. We have got to get to this last place. And I've changed Jackie's slide from rollout to the word impact. This is what we're after. We're after improving at a population level the well-being of, of the populations we want to serve. So we've got to get to impact if we're going to meet the, uh, the goals that we set, set out for TB. And it's this second valley of death, which is really uh, a t what we're confronted with today. The first uh, area is primarily the domain of the innovator, the manufacturer. But the question is, is who is going to build this second bridge? The manufacturer cannot do all of this. In fact, is going to need a lot of help. So they're really, so we have to grapple with uh, this, this challenge, which uh, I have in every one of my talks, and this is the, probably the biggest deterrent to progress in global health, silos. And it's everywhere, including the foundation. We don't consult with Welcome Trust or others very often about joint efforts. But there is so much talent out there amongst all the stakeholders, we have got to find some way to make these interoperable. So you see, I, I mentioned there's kind of two key stakeholders, the supply guys and the demand guys. Well, there are the facilitators. Supply guys are the manufacturers. The demand guys are the countries. And many of us are in the, uh, the, the middle category. So no institution is, is got the entire set of competencies required to, to succeed here. So we have a test case coming. And Claudia mentioned Mobio, and I, Mobio, 
to me, is really interesting. They have crossed that first chasm. They have commercialized. And now they're moving into, we want to move into this other area called impact. And for this, we're all going to have to work together to make this happen. So this is the challenge that we have. We have got to actually go beyond the assured criteria. And I think somebody, maybe fine, or somebody, we could have a contest, come up with a cool acronym like assured that covers the demand side. This is our big challenge now. We, we work on policy, there's advocacy, political will, budget allocation, commitment to coordinated volume forecasting. Remember the price volume thing? We need high volumes to get to low pricing. You can't expect anybody, mobile or otherwise, to give you a $5 NAT test with uh, 100,000 annual orders. We've got to get into the millions. Clinician behavior, healthcare worker, the, all of these demand issues have got to be addressed. So um, with that, I'll stop. Uh, we'll have a panel session, but uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We do have, yeah, we do have time for one, two questions. Uh, I understand the issue of cost, but is the issue of cost scaling at the beginning? No, I, I understand all your, um, I, I mean, that you need to start right, you need to know that, you need to reach that. But let's talk about the eyeglass market. If the eyeglass market was started with the issue of, of cost at the very beginning, we probably wouldn't have any eyeglass at this point. Now we need to reduce the cost and, the, and to redefine the essay, to improve the essay. But uh, maybe we can consider that we have a complex market, so we have some places where people are ready to invest more and, and that can buffer the cost in other countries or something like that. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I really see only two solutions. The ideal solution is a market solution where you have sufficient evidence to say this is, what we, this is what we need, it meets our requirements, and there's sufficient early engagement with countries to try to incorporate, implement into the countries to get to that faster ramp up. That admittedly is a high ask. Um, the other solution which I see is that uh, if you have these low volumes, then uh, funders come in and buy the price down for a period of time until those volumes can kick up at which time those economies of scale can kick in, and then you can get to the same pricing. So it's a good point, Daniel. Um, I'm Kathleen from Access Campaign MSF. Um, I think this is all great, but there's one other thing that's very challenging, and I think it's funding to get through the fine WHO endorsement process. Yeah. That's a very big bottleneck for some new technologies coming mm -hmm. through, and I think that's kind of a missing no, piece of No, that's a great point, uh, uh, Kathleen. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, so uh, clearly, and this is, I think is a, a deterrent for IVD companies coming into this game, and that is these trials are kind of extensive trials. Not only those trials for WHO endorsement, but the subsequent trials in every country to, uh, to show that this thing works in all those countries. I think we, so the funding, uh, if you have the right intervention, uh, I think the funding will be there to do those trials. Uh, that's just the beginning. That gets a WHO policy uh, statement if it meets the, the grade, and Chris can talk about that. Um, but then you, we have to also get to the, those fundings for the subsequent implementation and the, uh, the demonstration studies in the countries. So it's a good point. Okay. Thank you very much.